God seems super busy these days, off condemning someone for eating shellfish while the group of bored murder kids takes up killing as a way to pass the time. There isn't as much else to do in a dilapidated family pizzeria slash serial killer souvenir emporium, at least until Mike takes up the recently vacated night guard position at Freddy's Fazbear's Pizza. He might just have that special something the ghost kids need to break up the boredom before they mutilate him, of course. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the animatronic nightmares in Five Nights at Freddy's. This poor guy's a goner, and it's a real tragedy since he actually wears the security guard uniform that came with the night guard shift at Freddy's, even though no one else is here, even though no one even double checks that he showed up for his shift. He's going to die wearing a god tie, which in my humble opinion is worse than being murdered. He barricades the door to his office with the flimsiest sh** he can find, and unscrews the ventilation grate, crawling until he reaches a hallway where the lights shut off something hunts him in the dark. It begins to sing right before it knocks him out, and he wakes strapped to a chair, staring down a second string jigsaw trap. <laughs> He half removes a screw restraining one of his hands, but he's not quick enough to escape his Looney Tunes fate. I don't know, try wiggling down? Across town, we meet Mike, a character so full of trauma, we're gonna feel like we know him better than our own family in about five minutes. He's in a custody battle with his aunt Jan for his younger sister, Abby. He's just lost his latest job following a string of anger management issues. <laughs> And years ago, his kid brother Garrett was kidnapped while he wasn't looking, something for which he feels insanely guilty. Mike also takes a heavy sleep medication and has been trying to use dream theory to remember details about the person who took Garrett. Will that come into play later? No, not really. Should it have? Probably. That would have been a killer take on Five Nights. Start working in a place where your brother's soul is trapped inside one of the monsters trying to kill you. But that's, unfortunately, above this movie's pay grade, above my pay grade, and not really why we're here. Anyway, with dwindling days to patch together his life and get a job before Jan can take Abby away, Mike goes to meet with a career counselor named Steve about work placement. Hold up for a second. Have you noticed how cyberpunk the world's trying to go right now? Our phones, our computers, our video games. It's tough keeping up with all the cyber psychos out there. But thanks to today's sponsor, The Ridge, we're bringing two more essentials into the future. The Ridge wallets are streamlined, perfect for surviving a 21st century of digital pickpockers. While all those other hosers are out there losing their digital gold like a dead Sonic, your Ridge wallet protects you with RFID blocking materials, comes with an optional AirTag attachment so you can find it anywhere, and they're protected by a lifetime warranty. Keep up to 12 cards in cash and a profile so slim it's almost subdimensional. And they're their key cases are just as durable, silently and securely folding away up to six keys for your stealth missions. Plus, the Ridge has expanded their color and material palette again to fit anyone's tastes. If you want something softer to the touch that looks like it came out of a neon nightclub from Blade Runner 2049, check out their ceramic powder wallets in sea glass, lavender, and eucalyptus. The new ceramic powder coating gives the case a smoother feel while maintaining its top quality scratch resistance. You and your digital girlfriend will love them. Right now, The Ridge is offering all my viewers 10% if they use my link ridge.com slash nerdexplains and the code nerdexplains. Thanks to The Ridge for keeping me in the how to beat game. Steve calls out Mike's repeated firings. He lost his last mall cop job after he chased and beat a man in front of his own son. Before he can explain the situation with his own brother's disappearance, Steve notices Mike's name and studies his face. I am just trying to figure out who you are, Mr. Michael. Sh Coffee? Steve ends up offering Mike a job, night shift, pays minimum wage. But Mike can't do nights while taking care of Abby. At home, Mike thanks his unpaid nanny, Max, for watching his sister, who's off in her room, not eating, compulsively drawing, and talking to her imaginary friends. 
pops his sleeping meds and starts trying to lucid dream the day his brother disappeared. He gets distracted when he's supposed to be watching Garrett, and when he turns, a man is driving off with him. It's a nice visual touch that Mike can't remember the license plate. Pretty sure reading things is supposed to be impossible in dreams. I don't know. The situation with Aunt Jan Karen gets worse, and Mike wonders if he should just hand Abby over. Abby's psychiatrist disagrees, pointing out that almost all of Abby's pictures include Mike. You know, pictures hold tremendous power for children. Before we learn to speak, images are the most important tool we have for understanding the world around us. Hmm, I wonder if that pointed statement will come in handy later. Cornered, Mike takes the shady job and arrives to his first shift at Freddy Fazbear's, a Chuck E. Cheese halfway to becoming a cyberpunk set piece. In the office, he finds an orientation video waiting for him. It reveals that the animatronic technology used to build the characters was cutting edge for its time. Using rechargeable lithium batteries that allow the animatronics to roam free within a limited area, the first night passes almost without incident. He falls asleep halfway through his shift. This time, however, the dream about Garrett is different. There's now five other kids watching the car drive away. The next day, Aunt Jan hires Max and Max's brother, Jeff, to wait until Mike leaves his next shift and ransack Freddy's, so he'll lose his job. Mike spends most of his second shift lucid dreaming. Mike begs the kid for info about Garrett's kidnapper. When they won't answer, he chases one down and gets a sharp stranger danger lesson. <laughs> Mike wakes to the electronics going haywire, music blaring over the loudspeaker, and the characters drawing closer to his location. The buzzer outside rings. It's a cop named Vanessa, who notices his arm is bleeding and lets herself inside, saying she knows where the first aid kid is. He asks how she knows the place, and she brushes it off, saying it's on her beat, before triggering the Freddy band to play and revealing that five kids disappeared from this Freddy's back in the 80s. Obviously, that last detail catches Mike's attention, just not enough to, you know, literally do any investigation into who might own the building or who the victims were. Since Josh Hutcherson wasn't even alive in the 80s. This movie is probably set about 10 years ago, around the time of the original launch of the Five Nights at Freddy's video game. So, Google definitely existed. A brief search would have pulled up all five of these kids' pictures pretty immediately, as well as a picture of the owner of Freddy's, or, at the very least, information about what happened to him and where he is today. Instead, the cop just hangs out until dawn, and then leaves as Mike is locking up. No wonder the police never caught the kid's killer. Probably busy waiting wasting taxpayer dollars playing skee-ball. Mike doesn't notice Jeff watching from nearby. After Mike leaves, Jeff, Max, and two others break into the pizzeria and start smashing, waking Bonnie the Bunny from her electronic dreams. Let's go, boys! Idiot number one is ransacking the kitchen when the fridge begins to rattle. Inside, he finds Chica's cupcake, a buck-toothed face hugger. <laughs> Jeff spots his heavy man searching for a hiding spot like a cartoon, and he ultimately picks the wrong one. <laughs> Bonnie turns his sights on Jeff, who immediately drops his crowbar. He locks himself inside the office and spots Cheek and Bonnie on the security monitors. They lower Cupcake into the ventilation system. Jeff barely manages to keep Cupcake out, only to turn and see the door open on its own. Bro, you couldn't even lock and jam the door after you came in here? I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Of course, he just walks into the hall. The door locks him out, and he rushes to an emergency exit, which is locked. Scary Fox corners him. <sighs> When none of her posse return, Max ventures inside looking for him. Child Ghost lures her into a storage area where broken pieces of animatronics litter the ground. Freddy is waiting for her. Despite being horrendous to look at and talking to her, Max walks right up to him. Yeah, so it should go without saying. If you're planning a smash and grab, a simple check-in text every five minutes, plus a plan for the lookout to leave if they haven't heard back after a certain amount of time, at least saves Max's life here. For the others, well, maybe it's just me, but I don't open things that start rattling on their own. For all you know, someone's using this dump to sell King Cobras and killer chimps. You were supposed to be here alone. Hearing anything means we abort immediately. 
Hell, you don't even have to ransack the building to cost Mike his job. Just graffiti the hell out of the facade and leave a spray can in Mike's car when he's not looking. On the third day, Mike gets a visit from Vanessa about the break-in. She says she could charge him with criminal negligence. Okay. Mike tells her about his brother's abduction. Oh, pulling that card again. God, it's like a broken record. Dude, get over it. It was a long time ago. No one fuck. Cares. And his theory about being able to remember the kidnapper in his dreams, saying that he's been using Freddy's because his dreams are more vivid there. Instead of saying, that's batch insane, she takes pity on him and lets him off with a warning. Unfortunately, Max is no longer available for babysitting, which means Abby's sleeping on the dirty, stinky, broken, glass-covered floor of this fast food nightmare tonight. Despite the cop's soft warning, Mike eventually falls asleep without the pills anyway. He talks to the blonde kid, offering anything in exchange for information about who took his brother. The kid accepts, drawing a cartoon rabbit on the ground. Back in the real world, a voice calls out to Abby, luring her into the showroom, where Freddy introduces himself. Mike wakes to Abby screaming. He discovers Abby's been playing with the very lifelike autonomous animatronics all night. He reacts like a half-stoned lion tamer until Abby reassures him that they're her friends. Mike whisks Abby home to find she's been drawing the five kids and the Freddy characters that they've possessed since he took the job, even though she'd never been there before. She's even drawn Garrett's abduction. She says the blonde boy showed her. He asks if the ghosts have mentioned their brother. She says they only talk about a yellow rabbit, but she's willing to ask them. So Mike brings her back for night four. They arrive to find Vanessa's already inside, but no one asks her why she has a key. She's not not at all surprised to see the characters come to life in Abby's presence either. She even helps them build a fort with Abby. When Vanessa offers to find them a roof for the fort, Mike leaves his kid sister alone with these trapped ghost children so she can ask about the abduction. <sighs> He peppers Vanessa with questions about how she knows so much about the building, but she won't tell him. Instead, she saves his hand when he goes to touch an empty animatronic husk in the storage room and tells him it's dangerous. They're spring locks. They're on all the older models so that a, a person can safely wear the suit. He admits that he's basically using his little sister to find out info about his brother's kidnapper. Vanessa tells him to drop it, but won't explain why. Maybe, and stop me if I'm wrong, she's hiding something from Mike. Maybe a quick online search might reveal a few things about this entire situation. Look, I know it's unsexy to look things up, apparently, but almost all the mystery in this story would be public record. We could have saved ourselves two of our five nights here with a few keystrokes. Vanessa is the the oracle of mixed signals. She's the first to agree to build a fort, but also in Mike's face anytime he mentions the Merc kids or finding his brother's killer for the eighth time. She's cool leaving Abby alone with these tortured spirits, but also knows they're super dangerous. Wait, Abby, jump! <laughs> You gonna take your electrocuted sister to the ER, Mike? What am I saying? This is America. We're just gonna walk it off. Outside, Vanessa threatens to shoot Mike if he brings Abby back here. So, he leaves her with Aunt Jan when he returns for his fifth night, bringing a full bottle of his sleeping meds with him. Bro's trying to astral project into the past. The blonde ghost kid tells him it's possible to change the past and make it so that Garrett was never taken. All they want in exchange is Abby. Well, it's likely Abby would have never have existed anyway if his brother was never taken. She's a trauma replacement kid if I've ever seen one. So this isn't really that terrible a trade. Of course, since we're not morons in the habit of believing ghost kids about anything, we're gonna have a lot of mechanical follow-up questions about this. Not to mention the obvious question no one addresses here, which is, why aren't we trying to free these? Why is everyone so blasé about this? Maybe I'm a secret big big-hearted softy, because mer- kids trapped in Frankenstein monstrosities seems like a bad time before we know who made them and how. Seems like freeing them up would fix all of our problems too. Anyway, Mike agrees to the trade so fast, it's legitimately the most surprising thing that happens in this entire movie. You love her, Mike, and she loves them. You've seen her with them. It's time to let her go, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> 
sure, he realizes how insane that sounds three seconds too late. But still, dude needs to see a shrink ASAP. Mike tries to take it back, but the kids aren't interested. They swarm like a school of sharks strapped with knives. You leave Abby alone! <laughs> And Mike wakes to the fate of the previous security guard. With seconds to spare, Mike pulls the same pins the guy before did and wiggles out before the mask can turn his face into chap suey. He lands in a pile of the thieves' bodies. Mike, you're in a storage room full of weapons. How about grab one? Oh, no, he's already gone. He breaks for the same exit and Foxy's there, humming his tune, ready to claim his next victim. Meanwhile, Freddy's over here like a vampire. He's already let himself into Mike's house and dispatches Jan before she even knows what hit her. So much for that short-range battery, the blonde spawn of Satan emerges to collect Abby, saying that Jan is just taking a cat nap on the floor. Sure, because everyone knows the fallen family guy pose is the most comfortable sleeping position. Mike wakes up, saved by Vanessa. Even now, prying answers out of this bish is like pulling tea. She says her relationship with the pizzeria is complicated. He tells her Abby's in danger because he traded her away like a kid at trading a homemade lunch for a snackable. I mean, it's not like they actually gave him his brother back. Vanessa finally comes clean, burying the lead like a corpse in her garden. She says police and parents practically tore the pizzeria down to the studs, but couldn't find any trace of the missing kids because their bodies were hidden inside the animatronics by her father, William Afton, the yellow rabbit. Vanessa shows Mike a photo of herself as a small child with the yellow rabbit, and she's holding the little toy plane Garrett was playing with when he was taken. And Long Afton killed his brother too. Of course, because that was a super rare collector's edition plastic plane, the toy company obviously only made one of those. What they don't come right out and say is that he used Vanessa as bait to pick victims. She says that the kids don't want to murder anyone, but the yellow rabbit influences them somehow. He asks for help. She tells him the key is electricity and hands him a cattle prod and a taser, but refuses to join him, saying that that she knows her father will be there. She can't face him. So, how about you tell us where to find dear old dad and we'll put him out of his misery for you. If she's right and their mur tendency is purely down to their connection with Afton, then killing Afton is the way to free not only Abby, but the mur kids too. The other option is ice cold, but we could call the parents of the mur kids and get one to meet us at the pizzeria. I bet it'd throw any ghost out of whack to see their parents again after so long. Use them as a distraction to win Abby back and convince the kids to work with you to bring Afton down. Even if we decide to sneak into Freddy's, we're going in prepared. Tasers and cattle prods. But since we're playing with electricity, we're also wearing thick rubber-soled shoes and bringing heavy-duty unsheathed wire and electrician gloves. We know that there's five characters to defeat and a sixth human villain, so we're also taking a gun. The fact that Vanessa isn't willing to come with hers or help us acquire one means she's not playing for our team no matter how badly she wants to. After all, she's a cop who's known for 20 years that her father was a serial murderer of kids and let him walk free. No number of nightly visits and table forts can excuse that. Mike crawls through the ventilation shaft to the showroom, sneaks up and electrocutes Freddy and Bonnie with a bucket of water. <laughs> a solid three out of five strategy, but only if we finish the job and tie them down with chains or keep them electrocuted. Using the electrician's gloves and unsheathed wire we brought, we can lay a live wire across their bodies attached to a power outlet. He finds Chica trying to feed Abby into the empty animatronic husk in storage. He tases Chica, but Cupcake watches from nearby. Again, two out of five effort. Shove Chica into the empty husk to remove both is a future danger. And since we know Chica has a cupcake because we've been paying attention, we'll search storage for her and dispatch her here. Instead, Cupcake attacks down the hall, latching onto Mike's leg. He finishes Cupcake off with the cattle prod. Great, now wedge its open mouth onto something hard and kick until the top of its head breaks off. Foxy tracks Abby to the ball pit. She's saved by Vanessa, who takes Foxy out with another cattle prod. Cattle prod's putting in that work. Nearby, Mike runs into the yellow rabbit. Bet a Glock 9 would have come in handy right about now. Mike tases him, but he's not entirely mechanical, and he just rips the prods away. He trounces Mike's wimpy ass. 
then summons the children he murdered to finish Mike off. Vanessa distracts him, and Afton reveals himself. Oh my god. The only other name actor we've seen this entire movie. Who could have seen that coming? Afton taunts his daughter, and she actually fires the gun, but it's a weak pot shot. Afton takes advantage, knocks the gun away, and stabs her. Mike remembers the power of pictures, and tells Abby to show the kids that Afton is the one who hurt them. She tears a nearby drawing off the wall, and replaces it with one of their mer which snaps the haunted souls out of Afton's control, and they take their own revenge. You are wretched, blood little beast! <laughs> Our human idiots grow a little, and the supposedly unmer- Ghost kids keep Afton in a state of painful purgatory as a little treat for themselves, I guess. Uh, uh. So, do we call a priest now? Get baby Haley Joel Osment over here for a little exorcism? Or are they just stuck in this busted pizzeria with their killer forever? That is bleak. Anyway, my advice is use a goddamn computer to make your life exponentially easier when the crazy stuff starts. Once you know these are murder kids, figure out their stories with or without the help of Vanessa, our secondary antagonist, and get them out of there. Kill Afton earlier if you have to. For those reasons, I think Five Nights at Freddy's was beat. And remember, if all the animatronics contain bodies, that means Cupcake is a kid's severed head.